welcome everybody. Um, wait, I'll wait for a few of you to hop on here. Uh, so excited for tonight's live um, chat with my special guest speaker. Um, for those of you who um, haven't heard, I'm actually on day two of cleansing. It's been very interesting. Uh, I usually find the winter cleanse so easy. It's a real breeze for me. Um, but I think I've had a little bit too much on my plate and I'm just feeling like a little bit out of it. But then, yes, Shannon just reminded me it's a full moon, so that might have something. On top of it. <laughs> Yes, yes. So um, if you are joining us tonight, please pop in the comments, let us know um, that you're joining us, um, where you're joining from. If you're not in Perth, um, we always love to hear um, where everybody is located. And um, I obviously know that, um, yeah, majority is from Perth and we're all in winter and everyone's cold. Um, so hopefully you're nice and warm. I've got the heater on behind me. I had my my dog like right in front of the heater as well. I was like, get out, get out. I'm doing a live now. So anyway, um, let's get started. I wanted to introduce you to my beautiful guest speaker tonight. I actually uh, met her a few years ago, I think it was, at a networking event. And I actually bought... A time ago, wasn't oh. it, Mel? <laughs> yeah. And I think and then last year... Oh, we was it last year? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what? It was. It was... April last year. Oh my gosh, you are so good. I don't how do you remember that? <laughs> I don't know. Flash of I'm not cleansing, so <laughs> there you go. Take that. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um and I oh my screen went funny. Uh and I remember I like just loved the presentation you did. So I bought your book and I came home and I was super excited um, and thought wow that yeah but I'm not going to say too much because I'll let everybody <laughs> and I'll ask you some questions around it but just to give you a bit of information about Shannon she's an international award-winning business and leadership coach speaker retreat leader and best-selling author uh, with over 16 years leading her own coaching and consulting company the Thrive Factor um, Shannon coaches um, ingenious souls to turn their lives and learned experiences, aka their wisdom, um, into income streams and wildly profitable ones at that. Welcome, Shannon. Um, I'm not going to do any more of a bio because I'd love you to share with all the ladies more about yourself. But before you do, you do have to answer my question. What's your favourite food? I know. I remember when Abby said that through and I'm like, where do I start? Because I love food. <laughs> you know, I just love eating. And I, where I went to was, it, it, it's really seasonal. And I think that would probably be something a lot of people would say. You know, in summer, I really love, you know, really fun salads and stuff. I'm not, I can't do salad in winter. I want really nourishing soups with, but, you know, lots of veggies. But I thought if I went to like favorite food and I think about all the travel I've done, I haven't been to Japan yet, but I would say that Japanese food is my favorite. Yeah, yeah, it's so good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fresh, light, interesting. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, creative. Yeah, they really bring out the creativity. Yeah. And, yeah, and such a good variety. I like yeah. it because it's a lot more seafood-based as well. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Good answer. Um, right, so <laughs> Thank you. I think I've got past we can keep <laughs> going. <laughs> um, how did you get into um, this? Like where, where did you sort of start off? Because I know... Oh that you've been in this kind of industry for nearly 20 years but yeah so yeah coaching for nearly 20 years because I first started coaching and learning about coaching as a framework and methodology when I was still in the corporate setting and working in a corporate health setting uh, my background my goodness me my professional background is wide and varied one of my archetypes which we know we're going to talk about the thrive factor framework and the archetypes but one of my archetypes is the mentor teacher yeah. She's and there's no doubt in my mind you have this because I see how much you you love to learn and share and the way that you teach and, and share knowledge and wisdom is just a classic signs of a mentor teacher but we're also the women out there in the world that love to go and do lots of learning both informal and formal and that for me has meant that I have lots of qualifications not quite like they didn't go out to go I need to stack up as many as I can just over my lifetime I've amassed lots so I have a background I was my original career was as a registered nurse oh, a long time ago. Yeah. And I worked in nursing for goodness me, 25 years maybe. I can't lose track of time. Uh, and 
but in that space I really stood up and was really pushed I think more than than put my hand up into leadership roles very young happened through school as well so leadership's always been a big part of my life even though I would have as a younger woman referred to myself as quite shy I'm definitely more introverted I don't you know I need time alone to recharge rather than loving and being you know and really energized by lots and lots of people so you know that was a whole nother thing to, to get around uh, and then coming back to Australia after I lived in the UK for nearly five years, I, I knew I had to change something. I knew I didn't want to continue with that career. It was a great grounding and, free, you know, a, a place to start because I've always loved people. And since my teens, I have been reading lots of things around different psychological principles and methods and research and you're not stuff again this is a mentor teacher influence not stuff your average teenagers reading but I just was so fascinated by humans and the way we behave and we act and this is long you know we're talking about the 80s I can age myself here you know in my teens but um people didn't use the word mindset we didn't talk about belief systems we maybe talked about values or what you value but that was about the sum of it and the personal development industry existed but it wasn't like it is now so I was that curious soul that was already going out and trying to understand like who am I where do I fit in the world and you know why does that person do this and that person think like that and say that So fascinated me for a large part of my life. So on coming back to Australia, actually I did a qualification in counselling when I was in the UK and then coming back home was like I want to study more and I actually did some formal business study before I then went and did more human focused study, which I qualified as a transpersonal uh, therapist. So that's some of the kind of qualifications. Pull that together has given me an incredible foundation to then move into my own business 16, 16 and a half years ago and to start working as a coach, specifically around the business space. I've got a long history family. I've been in small business, so that made sense to me. But it was really also about leadership, and I've done work in the corporate area as well around leadership. And so while I share a lot of the work that I do personally is focused around business, the Thrive Factor framework and the archetypes that unlocking your effortless success zone is for any woman. Yes. So, yeah, which is, so I think, such an important thing to share. So, yeah, I, I love what I do. I've been doing it a long time now. Sometimes I feel like I've been doing it forever. <laughs> but I, there is definitely other parts of me as well that it all influences. That's why I talk about the value of your lived and your learned experience. Mm-hmm. So we're not just focusing on well, what am I qualified in or what, you know, what have I learned to do, but what have I lived through as well? Because that influences who we are in the world. Yeah. And it significantly influences our beliefs, our mindset, our behaviours, our emotional state and how we, how hard we believe or effortful we believe things need to be. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's funny how the personal development world is such a big thing at the moment. It's I feel like it's just keeping going up like this. It's, you know, it's, it's been coming for a long time, but, you know, the conversations we have in general conversation now, okay. you can have you can chat around things that were very much only if you kind of had done some personal development yes. not that many years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you find there's so many um, experts now too, so <laughs> you've got the pros and cons. True. Of that. True. <laughs> I think one good thing is that we've created a lot more self awareness because yes. I think that we don't sort of learn self-awareness it's not unless we have a a parent that's really done the work themselves but the generation I don't know of my parents it's there wasn't a lot of learning about self-awareness and it's hard to understand how to look within or how to seek you know and and you yourself and and we we spend more time worrying about what other people look and see yeah so much that what we are what we see so yeah. I think one good thing is that there's a, a lot more people waking up to um, themselves and trying to figure out who they are and what they do and why they do it mm-hmm. which is obviously where you come in and help people yeah so much you think if you go back to the ancient you know Greek philosophers the one of the big philosophies that was discussed and I can imagine being in a kind of a circle as wise people I'm going to say wise men because I believe there hopefully were women there too um but you know that it was all around know thyself 
Yeah. And what does it mean to know thyself? So this is a, a lifelong, like as long as humans have existed, there's been this curious, who am I? Yeah. But like you said, Mel, there's so much noise and external influence that we get fixated on trying to make meaning of our understanding. Where do we fit? What does that mean? Who am I by that person's definition? And we get lost and we get clouded instead of being able to know how to go within Mm. and to understand who we are. Mm. And one of the things that underpinned the creation of the Thrive Factor framework, which is a framework of 12 archetypes, which is female-centric, so it's written for women and those who identify as female, um, was around giving everyone who was interested a reliable psychology-based way to understand who they are at this point in time. Mm. And archetypes, I'm sure that there's some of the the ladies listening have heard the word word archetype. When I first started defining archetypes 12 years ago for the framework, I'd get these blank stares or these kind of eye rolls like, well, I don't know what weird word she's talking about. (laughs) Whereas now less people are like, oh, yeah, archetype. They may not fully understand what it is, but there is more of an understanding, at least a familiarity of the word. And go back to those ancient kind of, you know, philosophical times, archetype comes from the words arche and chupos, which means first impression. So it's the impression we have and that we share with the world. Sometimes that impression, though, that we share with the world is not who we really are because of all that external busyness and noisiness that's, telling us or giving us a I guess a false sense of reality of having to be a certain way certain look a certain way sound a certain way dress a certain way you know have a certain type of job or whatever it is there's so many external as I said real noisy busy influences sort of suggesting these things and we can get really stuck in trying to fulfill the expectations that we believe are had of us rather than actually again getting quiet going within and understanding who we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I read, I often say it, and I think I've said it probably more in the last couple of years with this, yeah. you know, the way that the world's been in the increase in self-inquiry because some people have had a lot more time than they have had for a long time to consider. Came from it, it is a good thing, yeah. Started to look at themselves. Yeah, so definitely. You your house, you don't have a choice. <laughs> no, but, you know, what I say often now and in, in increasingly is that self-awareness and self-understanding are two of the biggest assets for life and our work. So I often say life and business because I tend to mostly be teaching or working with women in business, but it's it doesn't matter whether you're in business or you have a career or you stay at home, you know, doesn't matter what it is, but, you know, self-awareness and self-understanding, massive assets mm-hmm. that we don't tap into, that under underutilized, under, you know, underrated often, often push aside as, that's nice kind of soft skills I hate that phrase soft skills (laughs) you know it's so powerful it is so powerful because um I think for me when I work with clients a lot of the work is based on us learning how to reconnect with what our body's talking and telling us throughout the day women get so shut off because they're in that busyness busyness of life or yeah everybody else's needs first and then forget to actually listen what is my body needing right now am I hungry Mm -hmm. Thirsty? Do I need to stop? Do I need to breathe? Do I need to go out? Yeah. You know, yeah. Busy, busy, go, go. And and one good thing about the last few years is that we've had to slow down, and so we've had to really notice things whether we wanted to or not, and that has created that self awareness um, and being able to understand ourselves as well, like our patterns of behaviour, because it's easy to just brush it aside and ignore it and not really want to you know, go a little bit deeper and go, mm. why do I do that? Yeah, that's it. Get to the curious place. And you said, you know, self-awareness and self-understanding are not the same. Mm, yeah. I think they get confused or or sort of lumped in together as being the same, but they're not. And for me, the self-understanding is the step after the self-awareness. The awareness is the curiosity and the challenging, the questioning yourself. You know, if you want to change something because you're not happy or you don't feel like it's a healthy way to be, no matter what that is, with, with what your work that you do or the work that I do, if we're unhappy or we just, or we may not be unhappy, but we desire to live some live a different way or be a different way, then we have to start with a self-awareness. So what is that all about? Why, why are we looking for that? What can we do for ourselves to make change? And underpinning all of the work around the creating the Thrive Factor framework was the principles of personal leadership. And 
while I talk about being in a leadership space and as a leadership coach, uh, so often leadership is looked at as an external thing. It's a what we do for others or with others rather than actual self or personal leadership. Yeah. And when doing that, I feel like it's a really disempowering thing a lot of the time if we're just focused on the how we lead others rather than how we lead ourselves. Yeah, we're kind of giving away our power, if you like. And I've had thousands of conversations, as I imagine that you have, in different kinds of ways where so many people I know have felt that they had no choice in a situation or, you know, to be able to change a way they're thinking or what they're doing and now, I always say that you may not, like genuinely, you may not in a particular situation have a choice about being there, but you always have a choice about how you respond to that. Yes. And that's such a, again, the self-leadership is, well, how am I going to actually respond to the situation I find myself in or the way that I'm feeling or, you know, what's happened to me or what I've been a part of or what I desire to be, do, have, become. Mm-hmm. You know, we've always got a choice. But, again, we get distracted because we live, as you said, in this busy life. Where we let the business take over Rushing and we live in there for an effortful life rather than an effortless life. Yeah, yeah, good. It's, it, yeah, I really like how you've said that self leadership as well, because I think that when people are feeling lost and it's when we're not doing those sort of things, reflecting within or connecting within, feeling lost. Um, and yeah, it's always that we, just it's like we've um not hardwired but conditioned to go and look after everybody else and yeah. So, yeah look after everybody else to look externally for answers solutions outcomes yeah. you know, understanding and yet so much value and treasure is actually within us yes exactly yeah yeah, yeah. So um, I would love you to share a little bit about um, the, whether you want to talk about the Fry Factor or mm-hmm. the reasons for picking this particular topic. What is it that um, I guess is the the reason why you love sharing the message with women? Yeah. So to, and I love how you held up the book earlier. So yes, this is one of I've got I have published self published three books, contributed to many others. Only two of them are in print. This one and then my new book that came out earlier this year, Braggadocious. The out of bold self-celebration, which is a 12-month journey of celebration with an archetype each month to inspire you. But this one is like, it's often referred to as the Thrifactor Bible. So as you know yourself, Mel, it's got every, you know, every a chapter for every archetype. But the subtitle of the book is Unlock Your Effortless Success Zone. And the reason that I chose that and wanted to use that as a topic for tonight was I'm very mindful of your audience and your community, and it's not a business-focused community. So Sometimes I tweak what I'm talking about, so it's I always want to make it as relevant as possible to the those that may be listening. But the reason that that was the subtitle for the book and so important is that because really, in my own life experience, through my lived experience, but also through my observation of working with people in so many different ways in different parts of the world, also, is that what I said that we so often are stuck in this belief that an effortful or a, a hard you know, that life is always going to be hard Mm. and it doesn't have to be. It can be much easier and more effortless than we believe. Yeah. And when we can come to that space of understanding that we can actually create more effortlessness, and that's not effort-free, it's effortless, yeah, and that's a really key distinction as well. But then we, we start to understand and we really can embody and, and embrace the fact that things can be easier. It, it does come down to us a lot of the time. And this is that, that personal, that self-leadership again of knowing that we have influence over every single thing. We think, we believe, we do, we feel, we how we behave. We actually do have influence over that. There are certainly times in our lives and some people have horrific experiences where they, they're not going to believe that they have any influence over that. But I think the majority of us actually do realise when we stop and give ourselves a chance to think about that, we realise that, oh, actually, I can actually change this. Yeah. Yeah? And it's worth it. Like, yeah, it might take a long time for you to make the changes you want to make or to create the desired result or outcome or way of living, but is it worth it or would you rather just stay where you are? (laughs) I know for me it's worth it. I see it's worth it. So I really want to challenge the thinking and the belief systems and the emotional states that so many of us have, where we have been brought up in 
society and I from the conversations I have with women around the world this is not an isolated thing to like where you and I are in Perth this is you know cross culture <laughs> cross cross you know, cross gender cross different you know age groups as well is that we have so many of us have been have grown up listening to it's going to be really hard and it's always going to be really hard oh my god yeah, yeah? and I got that from my family a lot and a lot of you know you know, you know if you but also if you work really 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 hard you might do okay and how cool would that be and do okay like I don't want to, I didn't don't just want okay for all that effort yeah. you know yeah. and so from a young age I said like I've always been curious and I did have um I was very grateful that my dad when I was younger he's no longer with us but he was probably an early adopter for personal development and he used to listen to these things that he used to refer to as mind tapes, so cassette tapes. Oh, yes. And it was early kind of mindset and probably hypnosis kind of, you know, different messaging. Oh, I, yeah. I bought it yeah. on one of the late TV shows and he got this yeah. like, box and it just had all these tapes. Yeah. And he used to, so he used to talk to me about that and he always used to say, you, cha- you change your thinking, you can do anything. Yeah. So I know that that, oh, I wasn't, you know, that was an, an not a word to say I don't I'm the lover of the word normal but that wasn't what was happening in a regular teenager's home when I was a teenager I've got two younger brothers and they're like I don't even remember dad talking about that stuff but I think he realized that I was interested and I was the one who was asking questions and curious so I had a head start when it came to mindset didn't there was no word for it back then mm-hmm. um but again that started me on that understanding that the thinking was a bit, you know, I guess the first place, that's the first part of self-awareness. Well, what am I thinking about right now? How, what, what is my thinking doing and my feeling doing in response to what I'm being asked to do or, you know, what I'm doing at work or how I'm raising my kids or whatever it is, mm. yeah? And instead of being stuck in that it has to be hard to ever get anywhere, does it really? You know, challenging it, does it really? One of my favourite questions to ask for so many different scenarios, and I challenge myself with all this all the time because of my four archetypes of a possible 12 in the trifecta framework, three of them are overthinking archetypes. So I can often go to the overthinking, making it harder than it needs to be. So I ask this question of myself and with clients all the time, how can this be easier? Mm. Now, how can this be easy? But how can this be easier? So it stops me in my tracks and go, oh, wait a second, yeah, I just, I'm making this way too hard. So if anything feels too, like you can't move forward, you feel stuck, it feels heavy, it feels, you know, controlling, you drained your energy, that's a great place to start, just to stop you from whatever pattern you're in yeah. and to reset and to go, oh, yeah, wait a second, maybe it could be easier. Instead of just staying stuck or stuck yeah. in yeah. and not moving forward and yeah. not there's another way out. Yeah. yeah, and, give you know, creating more effort. Yeah. Rather than going, wait a second, you know, I've probably created a lot of this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can also change it. I am the greatest influence I have over myself always. Love that. Yes. Yeah. I like to that too. And I think there's some confidence and, um, and clarity just by um, starting to feel like you're moving forwards instead of like you're running around in a circle. So much. Yeah, and that you are going forward. So, um, but also knowing a little bit more and understanding more about yourself, I guess you get that that confidence yeah. because you, like you said, you know your archetypes, so you kind of know what to expect from yourself and how you're going to go into projects or relationships or um, finances into you know which how you're going to deal with them. Yeah, definitely, and you know when we look at using archetypes as a framework as I mentioned before it is is a, a related to psychology so it's not some kind of made up thing that you know I just plucked out of nowhere it was something that took a lot of time to research and again I've used it for over 12 years now I have a number of women that have worked with me and qualified as trifecta coaches so I'm not the only one using this framework with their with her clients which is very cool but the psychology part of it is giving us a reliable way to create that self-awareness and deepen our self-understanding. And when we are able to do that and we look at it from the perspective of archetypes, archetypes traditionally look at the light and shadow of something, so the light and shadow of your personality. And I wanted to change that language only because in my experience and all the psychology-focused study I've done, shadow often got a bad rap. It's the bad, 
not so good, negative, whatever things about us. And yet when we can actually understand our shadow and what's contributing to it and the ego aspect of it, it's usually the bit that gives us the greatest wisdom, <laughs> yeah? yeah? So in the Thrive Factor world, we refer to light and shadow as strengths and potential challenges. And the word potential is also incredibly key because, you know, I have four archetypes in my Thrive Factor profile. You might have three, you might have up to six, Mel, does you know but we could have this we could have four of the same mm -hmm. you could have a fifth one and that fifth one depending on what that archetype is could completely change the way the other four show up and into like interact with each other yeah. so when we look at an archetype and we read about it in in the book or we've listened to you know, listen to someone teaching about it we I don't didn't want women to adopt a look at all these challenges Shannon's listed and she said that all this shit's going to happen to me because it might not, right? Yeah. Because of the different archetypes you have and understanding that the influence and the, the way that the archetypes work together in harmony or sometimes they're not in harmony. But being able to understand that, what has happened and I get have had this word shared with me so many times over all these years I've been working with the archetypes is that a, a level of permission comes in. And so often women have said to me things like, I feel like I have permission to be myself, uh -huh. permission to be who I've always wanted to be because I actually am her, but I couldn't see it. Yeah. They were so focused on the challenges being actualized and all of the, the bad, terrible, hard, you know, those kind of things going on that they'd lost focus of all the strengths and the wisdom and the gifts and the magic that they had to bring to the world yeah. and that they, they have there available to them. So when we can understand the strengths that we have, which we have available to us all the time, and we consciously use them, this is when we unlock our effortless success zone. Mm. Yeah? And it's not that the challenges don't become actualized, they don't go from potential to actualized, but when they do, we understand where they've come from and we know which strengths that we can use to help us to navigate the challenge and to make it a meaningful experience rather than a negative kind of contracting effortful experience yeah yeah I love that that's awesome um, I just wanted to see is there any ladies that wanted to uh ask any questions please pop in the comments if you have any questions about anything that um Shannon's talking about or uh if you would like to understand uh, a little bit more about what she does please pop in the comments and I'll mm -hmm keep an eye out um can you just share with us a little bit about the archetypes and how mm. <laughs> I know it's kind of a big big answer but maybe it is it is but I can share maybe if I talk about a couple of archetypes that I yeah. you know think are probably likely common you know not common as in a everyone's going to have them but would more likely show up in your community because when I talk about an individual archetype, that's when women can understand it. And even if, as I'm sharing this and anyone who's listening is like, yeah, that's not me, you probably immediately come to mind a friend or your sister or your mum or your daughter or someone else that you know who has that archetype. And there, as I said, there's 12 of them. So when I present uh, or teach around all 12 of them in one go, I always say it's a minimum hour and that's it, and which is probably what you got when we did when you, we met last year. It's like at hyper speed and it's like just giving the surface of all of the archetypes because there's so much depth. And you said, you know, two you know, books and more on the way. So we've got some more, more manuscripts in the, in the works. But I, what I want to share, one of the archetypes that I find is so frequently shows up in women in uh, the world these days is the inspirer believer archetype. And I, as I said before, I think you've probably got the mentor teacher. I reckon you probably have this one as well, Mel. And in the background, you can see there are flames there. And this is as much a re representation as the kind of the spark of inspiration for the inspirer believer as it is a reminder that this is a fiery, energy-driven archetype. And energy is kind of like her core language, if you like. This is one of my four archetypes. And the inspirer believer is here to be inspired. She loves to seek out understanding things. She sees the good in, in, in everybody, to be honest. She is a great, I call her the potentialist. She sees the potential in someone and really wants them to see it in themselves. That's not always what happens, but she's, you know, kind of the cheerleader archetype. So I love her. She's an amazing archetype to have in the space of being a coach. Yeah. And I can, you know, she she shows up and she is anyone who, who wants it, whether they want it or not. And I I guess you know it's such an excitable as I said energetic archetype 
But the thing about the energy is that she can have peaks of energy, but she can also have troughs of energy. So when she's given so much and cheered so much and seen the good in people and stuck up for them and it's not been kind of acknowledged and rewarded or she's sought inspiration and not been inspired, her energy can dip and it can dip quite suddenly. So she lives often in this state of kind of being, I'm all here or no, I need to nap for a day or two to recover. Yeah. And and influenced a lot by her environment as well. So when uh, an inspired believer is not taking care of herself, she's not nurturing and nourishing herself, no matter whether that is rest or it's what she's eating or it's her movement or nourishing her mind, body, spirit, soul, all of the different things and inspiring herself, she's going to struggle to have consistent maintained energy. It's not going to be sustainable for her. And when she's in kind of the, we call it the depths of despair or the cave of misery often, that she gets to that space where she can literally go from yesterday feeling like she's had the best day ever. It was, you know, she was on fire, literally like, you know, that all the energy was there to today go, oh, I don't know why I'm bothering with this. Like it's just hopeless, helpless, throw throw in the towel. And it's a really key thing for an inspired believer to remember that that's a fleeting thing usually. It might not be, you know, momentary, but it might go longer than that. But she will come back to her own energetic self. It needs to go back to nourishing herself. Mm-hmm. One of the quickest ways for her to regain her energy and get back her spark of inspiration and reconnect with the belief systems which have guided her in her life, like a, a compass or a guidance system, is to ensure that she is allowing herself to be inspired by who she is, what she's creating and what she's sharing with the world, which is often not what she does. It's all about being inspired by everybody else and forgetting that she's phenomenal. She often finds herself receiving incredible compliments and feedback from people, often using the words, oh, you're so inspiring or you're such an inspiration or I could never do what you do or you're so motivating. And an inspired believer can often take a long time to take on that feedback and actually believe it. So while belief systems are so important to her, she can be like, but doesn't everybody like that? And that's usually what the response is when I talk to an inspired believer about that trait that she has, that she is here to be an inspiration to the world and others genuinely seek her mm-hmm. out to be inspired and motivated by her. Mm-hmm. They love her energy and, you know, when she's kind of can be, make everything feel bright and sparkly and fabulous, you know, put an optimistic spin on things. But she can be a bit doubtful, a bit mis. Let's say what's the word kind of unsure that people are really genuine with that feedback mm. and so she can often push it away and go oh that's just what I do or isn't that don't you do that too but there are actually people out there in the world that are not inspired believers yeah I when I run retreats or do group kind of things is often maybe one woman because this is an archetype that shows up frequently in my client community there might be one soul that doesn't have the inspired belief and she sticks out a mile because everyone else is getting all, you know, building energy and getting all excited and like, you know, waving pom-poms kind of thing metaphorically. And she's like, what are you all getting all jazzed up about? Like what's going on? Doesn't get it at all. Yeah. And can find it really challenging to be with people that are so strong in their belief systems, which is also the key part of the inspired believer. But those belief systems can be many and varied. And when they no longer serve, an inspired believer can drop them and move on to the next thing very fast. So what that can look like in the external world is, you know, one week we're like, we're all into this thing and this is what we just learned about this or we read a book or listened to a podcast or or heard someone speaking. This is so cool. You know, tell everybody. We can become like an evangelist wanting the world to know about this really cool thing we discovered. And then for some reason, at some point in the future, like, yeah, that makes no sense to me anymore, move on. And people are like, but I thought you were just into that other thing, you know, just yesterday, yeah? And some people in our lives can find it hard to keep up with how fast we can move through the things that are important to us and that motivate and excite and inspire us. So, you know, you get the rolled eyes and the, oh, what's she into now kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, resonate. <laughs> resonates and I can think of a few people as well <laughs> yeah we always always can said and yeah sometimes it, I feel not sorry for but I feel like the women in the world that are not inspired believers as you said there's very few women in my world um that they're not that they're missing out because everyone's combination of their own archetypes is your you, you, your own unique you know it's your thrive factor profile it's a your own combination of who you are and really getting to know that and sharing yourself in the world through that lens is so important 
but there's a different kind of an energy when you don't have an inspired believer archetype. But equally, women that have the inspired believer and kind of get tired of going from that peak of energy to the trough of energy, I don't to give her away. Like I'm over her. She's just training me and making me feel terrible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, a lot of women that have that archetype will also talk about or share when it comes to looking at their health situation, or they are often the women that have had chronic fatigue or talk about, you know, illnesses to do with energy and feeling drained and things beyond the, you know, I guess the, the kind of general things that you'd experience. It's kind of a, a deepened or a next level experience for a lot of women in that space. So, yeah, so that's the Inspire Believer archetype. So if we've got time. Do you want me to share another one quickly? Yeah. Ladies, um, please comment. Let us know what you think. And does anyone resonate yeah. with a uh, inspired believer? Um, you're inspired believer. I'm sure they will. <laughs> I thought that might be one of my cards because I pulled a card because I've got the whole card deck, but I pulled yeah. it on the, the day I met you and I thought maybe that was that, but it's not. It's a different one. Which one did you pull on that day? Ah, the shapeshifter alchemist. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that was, I was tossing up to whether to share her or the advocate rescue, but I felt like the advocate rescuer might be oh, more, yeah. Yeah, yeah, more relevant for your community. So yeah. this is the advocate rescuer here. So that, that is a, representing a lotus flower in the middle. And then in the bottom here is like a life raft with a heart in the middle. Mm -hmm. But this is the archetype of compassion. That doesn't mean to say that the advocate rescuer is full of compassion for herself. She's always brilliant at taking care of everybody else, over delivering, over giving, saying yes without even considering the consequences. And she can deplete herself very quickly. So there is an energetic aspect to this archetype like the Inspire Believer, but it shows up differently. The advocate rescuer approaches the world with a desire to be an advocate, but to she often will talk about wanting to empower others. You know, I want to show people, I want to help people, I want to do, give back, I want to, you know, it might not be people related. She tends to give of her time, her energy, her resources, her money, skills, whatever, to the, the, the causes that are most important to her. And they could be related to people, to environment, to animals, to a combination or to all three. Mm. The advocate rescuers I know are the first ones to volunteer or be volunteer because people around them know that they'll always say yes. They won't turn down an invitation to help. Yeah. Sometimes they get very taken advantage of because of that. And what that happen, what can happen then is that the rescuer mode of coming in and fixing things and doing things for other can be amplified and not in a healthy way at all. <clears throat> in fact, often an advocate rescuer is really seeking acknowledgement and appreciation from the world and yet when she doesn't feel she gets it she gets resentful she gets moody she gets grumpy she can be like a, a martyr she can be like well they always they always ask me but no one ever says thank you it's that kind of an energy and then she feels terrible about herself because that kind of goes against who she is and yet at the same time you can kind of understand where it's all coming from and when she's in that space of feeling like that she can often come across as being very needy yeah, which is not a good energy to be expending or expanding into the world because people will draw away from you and yet you want to be with people. You want to be helping. You want to be supporting. You want to be doing what you can. Mm. But turning that into yourself and learning the true meaning of advocacy and self-advocacy is actually the gift for the inspired believer. Mm. It can be very good at jumping in and assuming when people need help uh, and often she does things or, you know, comes again from a beautiful, big, compassionate heart. So it's like the, the Eastern goddess of, of compassion, Kuan Yin. It's that kind of an energy. The intention's there for to want to help and to be supportive. But if she's jumped in and just decided that someone must need her for something and that person doesn't, that can create a really uncomfortable, yep. not so, you know, really often a, can end up in a not so good outcome dynamic. And then she feels terrible. But you've been at the same time. So, but I was only trying to help when someone's like, yeah, but I didn't ask you for help, like that kind of a thing, right? It's exact, We can all do that to a degree, but for an advocate rescue, there's more of her path in life. Mm. A lot of women that work in health, in health and the healing industries, a lot of nurses, for example, have the advocate rescue archetype. They're often in the rescuer part of it more than the advocate. But the advocate is about learning 
about what you want and learning to use your voice, learning to speak up and to ask for what you want and need rather than to let others try and work it out. Yeah. Yeah? Have those expectations. Yeah. Yeah. And learning that the true meaning of empowerment is not doing for other people. It's actually leading by example and showing them how. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. 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 So not always a effortless thing for an advocate rescuer to get but when she understands this is what I really want and need and I'm going to start asking for that and I'm also going to start saying no to the things that I really don't want to do Mm. which is not her usual like it's not her default you know she can feel incredibly uncomfortable particularly because there'll be so many people in her world that are used to her saying yes but hearing no from her is like what do you mean what's going on yeah, she's got to work through that discomfort and go, no, this is, you know, this is something that I need to do for myself. Saying no to something external is also a form of saying yes to yourself. It's done from that self-leadership kind of a way. So, yeah, so that's the Advocate Rescue, a beautiful archetype. She's got such a heart of gold and so much love to give, but she can often be misguided mm. or she can get to that space of feeling like no one has acknowledged her, she's not appreciated, she's not cared about, and giving herself all the, like, that huge breadth of compassion and love that she so effortlessly gives to others is a way for her to be in her effortless success zone. Yeah. I meet a lot of women like that in this yeah. community. I think that it results in that burnout and resentment and mm-hmm. um, women, yeah, you're sitting in that and then get stuck there without yeah. really- it's sort of like the the not a fallout but it's what can happen from that's it and when you're in that space this that's when all of those the mindset the beliefs the feelings of things being hard and it's always going to be like this and I have no influence I I can't lead myself Mm. that's what happens and yet again when you can come back and go wait a second what do I need here what's most important for me to give to myself which is actually not a selfish thing to do. It's, I think, one of the most selfless things to do is to be able to identify that we need or desire something and to take action in line with that. We only show up as our best selves, but... Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Thank you. That's all right. I wonder how many women can resonate with that. I would love to hear if you can... I'm sure a lot. (laughs) Yeah, if that makes sense to you. Um, so how does women work with you and and what? how does the Thrive Factor and the Archetype yeah. to, well, if I just, to work with you? Yeah, with if you? I just focus on the Thrive Factor, Mel. So it, there's a number of ways to work with the Thrive Factor and to learn what your archetypes are. So working with myself or one of the Thrive Factor coaches, of which all their details are available on the website, thethrivefactor.com. So that's a, a website dedicated just to the Thrive Factor. I have a separate one for my business-focused work. Yeah. Um, but the thrivefactor.com is where you can go. Now, you can take a free assessment and with that you'll get to learn one of your potential three to six archetypes. Awesome. So you get to know one, yeah. which I find is often just a tease because, like, well, no, there's no one to know the rest of them because you're not, we are, none of us are just one archetype. Yeah. Um, and then there's um, other ways to work with them. So to do a, like a single session, which I call a Thrive Factor experience, some of the coaches call them slightly different things, but that's where you get access to the Thrive Factor assessment. So you can get to know exactly what your archetypes are. You get provided with a very detailed report that shares the archetype as a high level summary and also looks at what I we refer to as the four M's of momentum. So the, the mindset marketing money and magnetism and while marketing for women who are not in business might be like that's a bit weird you can look at marketing as actually the way that you express yourself in the world so like the way you kind of promote who you are so mindset marketing money and magnetism so you get to understand the archetypes through those four lenses and looking at the strengths and the potential challenges for each of the archetypes so that's included in the report you get that information for every one of your archetypes no matter how many you have Mm. I also work with clients where I'll do a three session package where we look at, we meet the archetypes in the first session. The second session, we look at their influence in either your business or your career. So the leadership aspect from that external perspective. And then the final session, we look at the interaction between the archetypes. So where are they more likely to be in harmony? Where might there be clashes within your archetypal profile? And how do you work with that? Yeah. So that's a really deepening understanding of that. 
Uh, so that's kind of the key ways to learn about them. And I have just released late last month, I still haven't even really promoted it that much yet. So your community is one of the first groups to hear about it. But where I've, I have also personally made available, and some of the coaches are, are not doing this yet, but there's something I've made available. We can take the assessment and get access to the report when if you decide that you don't want to do the one-on-one -on -one session. So they're all different price points. I won't talk about the pricing so much because my pricing and the coaches have all got sort of slightly, you know, a little bit different pricing. Um, but you know, if anyone wants anything, just reach out to me. I'm happy to receive a, you know, a direct message on Facebook and everyone will be able to see me in your group. Yeah. Um, you know, if that's the easiest way for people. If you're curious, reach out and ask. Just let me know that you heard me chatting to Mel and uh, you want to know more. So, and then for anyone who is in business, the Thrive Factor is infused in every single way that I work with clients. I, on average, run at least one new program every month. In a couple of weeks, I'm just about to start the Thriving Money program, which is actually my longest program of five weeks, and then right through to my you know, one-on-one -on -one clients, mastermind group coaching. It, when you start working with me, you get access to the Thrive Factor assessment, so you get to meet your archetypes because you know, the way that I talk about branding or your mindset or the way you work with money, we look at it through that lens of the archetypes every single time. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's awesome. And I think yeah. women would love to be able to understand themselves and their behaviour better and, and, yeah. and have that confidence too. So Definitely. And if, if anyone just wants a copy of the book, uh, I am in Perth, so and I do have actually got some in stock. So if anyone is local, I'm happy, if you want to, you probably it's the most cost effective to buy it from me. Um, I would say than than Amazon, uh, and I can sign it for you. So <laughs> it's a, something you won't get getting it online. Yeah. Um, so again, just reach out and ask, and I can send people the link for that. That is awesome. Thank you so much. I would love women to be able to connect with you. We'll definitely put out your web address, which was the Thrive Factor. I think you said yeah, the ThriveFactor dot com is the one for the Thrive Factor, yeah. and Thrive Factor Co dot com is my business ah. my business and leadership yeah. Kind of stuff. Well, yeah both in there people that are interested so yeah awesome thank you so much you shared so much oh, about thank that. you for inviting me it was I great <laughs> you exactly what you're talking about not everybody it's helpful very, yeah very helpful so i really appreciate that if anybody yeah. has any questions for shannon please post them we'll make sure she answers them yeah definitely replay please hashtag replay and we'll get all those links um to you in the comment section and post some more um uh in a sing in a in a separate post as well yeah. thank you so much really appreciate it we'll have to get out soon yeah definitely it was so good to see you i just must say every time you were speaking mel i could see your bright colored nails i'm like oh, i love right. it <laughs> yeah, i've been so getting good. feedback about my nails um uh, feedback about my clothes lately so um it might have happened just about the end of summer about how I'm always wearing black and I was like no I've got really good I've got some colors in my wardrobe now I'm doing so much better but I as we slip into winter yeah. I'm sort of going so the last two nails I've like said to my beautiful nail lady please make them colorful <laughs> so, I know I love it I love it I can sometimes have like one or two of my nails a different color but I like to go the bright kind of colors as well yeah. I love color you know the, yeah. the, the artist and kind of art therapist to me has always been so inspired by color one of my archetypes, the visionary creator, is the artist archetype. So I've got to have colour in my life. And, yeah, I don't – I've got navy on tonight. I try not to wear black anymore. <laughs> I've well, told years ago not to. I think all my jumpers and jackets and cardigans and all that are all black. And so, yeah, yeah when you work from home, you can get a little bit – I forget to get changed. I just get up, you know, have exercise, have my shower, put my put the same clothes. I just don't – really stuff. I love it, though. But, yes, but you're jazzing that up for sure. So it's very cool. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Good night, ladies, and uh, thank you for joining. See ya.